Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to another episode of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Now, tonight we have a very special guest, an expert in the field of cyber law, and he will be here to help us understand and unpack what is hacking and what is cyber law. So I'm jo joined tonight by Sizwe Snail, uh, who is an attorney from Pretoria, and he obtained an LLB at Pretoria University, and uh, he's advanced that with a further degree in tax law. Uh, he's one, one of the few people that has done a cyber law effective, uh, elective, and he's got his own firm by the name of Snail Attorneys. And he is the international coordinator of the African Center for Cyber Law and Crime Prevention based in Kampala, Uganda. He's also the author of various articles on cyber law in accredited as well as non-accredited journals, both internationally and locally. And he's given ad hoc lectures for the Law Society of South Africa, as well as the ACFE, the University of Johannesburg, Fort Hare University, and the University of Pretoria. And, and he has commented on cyber law in various South African newspapers and has been a guest on many, many talk radios as well as a guest. He has also presented a number of papers and has attended both local and international conferences and is the co-author and editor of the third edition of Cyber Law at South Africa. He also does corporate law uh, in terms of um, cyber law and he regularly gives opinion to both the private and government sectors as well as individualized legal compliance testing and in-house workshop training for various private companies and government institutions both in South Africa and in Central West and East Africa. Sizwe Snail Kamutze is a member of the ICT review panel of the Department of Telecommunications and Postal Services and he serves as the chair of the e-commerce committee that's the digital society as renamed within the panel subcommittee. Sizwe Snail Kamutze also currently serves on the National Cyber Security Advisory Council of the DPTS and he is also currently serving as deputy chairperson for the LSSA e-law committee from 2013 to date. He is also a trainee adjudicator of the CIPL in respect of domination disputes and is a co-founding member of the annual cyber law conference head. Cizé, good evening and welcome. Hi, how are you doing? Very good. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Thank you for having me. Now, what is cyber law or what is before we come to cyber crime what is cyber law itself how do we how do we get uh, to understand what is cyber law well i always get the question what is cyber law and and, and the, the normal answer to that would be cyber law is the law regulating your handheld devices your emails basically electronic communications and how the the law uh, impacts on that that is cyber law in a nutshell right now, I see that you're also a research fellow in the field of cyber law at the University of Fort A, and you've been there since 2014. So obviously, this is an area of the law that is slowly gaining traction and, and exposure. Yes, I mean, cyber law has been there with the advent of the internet since right. your, your early 1990s. Um, it really, really started picking up traction in South Africa with the Electronic Communications Transactions Act in 2002. Right. And um, as you can see internationally, cybersecurity and, and e-commerce is, is the topic that people are talking about. Right. Now, often in the press, you know, one comes across uh, various reports. For example, there's a report that says... Um, your, your communication, all your, all your smart devices, your, your, your PCs, your laptops, all of this is monitored. Now, 
is monitoring itself illegal or are there instances of legal monitoring? Well, we do have the um, Interception and Monitoring Act, right. which is an act from 1992. Uh, and in terms of that, we have RICA, the Regulation on Interception and Monitoring, the, the famous RICA Act for your SIM cards. Right. Now, in terms of that, you may not unlawfully intercept or monitor anyone's data communication. Mm -hmm. In other words, how um, you can lawfully intercept is if you get a court order, for instance, mm. to, to intercept, or if there's a, an emergency and you are trying to locate someone, yeah. or there's an issue of state security that needs to be protected. Right. So there are certain grounds of justification, but the general rule mm. is that your right to privacy must be protected in terms of the Constitution and in terms of this Interception and Monitoring Act. Now, when we speak of you, you may have the right to approach a court and, and obtain... Who are we talking about? Are we talking about state institutions? Are we talking about private individuals? Are we talking about attorneys? Who, who, are we talking about business partners? Who, who exactly is, is this right available to? Well, this, this specific right to monitor, I guess it's, it would be the state. Right. And, and the limitations on that are for certain instances. In other words, you can't just as the state Merimo to just go and intercept and monitor people's communication. There has to be a, a, a justified reason, like I said, state security or the commission of a criminal offence. Right. And under those circumstances, a court can come to the aid of you and, and grant the police or the prosecutorial authority that right to, to intercept and to monitor. But I mean, surely it is subject to checks and balances. This is not a right that the court would easily just give away. I guess you have to be very convincing. Well, obviously, you'd, you'll have to go to court on affidavit and you need to explain that there's a, a possible commission of a very serious offence mm -hmm. that is about to take place or right. that has been taking place right. and you have not been able to, to get this evidence through normal methods. Okay. And it is for that reason that you will then ask for an interception order. So you've got to basically exhaust your normal routine or methods of investigation and really, would, would, I, would I be correct saying it's last resort? Only in the last resort could you turn to the courts and say, look, give me an order. Yes, I think, I think it's not just for the taking. Right. Um, you, you should have to try and do normal police work, right. do your investigation. And then if you do come to a, a dead stop or a cul-de-sac, it is then on that ground that you can then approach the court and say, look, we've, we've used all the traditional methods of investigation. We're not coming right. But we do have a good suspicion or we do have good reasonable ground to suspect that a particular criminal offence is taking place. The, the, the leading case for that would be the, the case of State versus Twelly, right. uh, where an interception order was granted and the communications on SMSs between right. the parties were then used for successful prosecution. This is the one where a minister's wife was involved in drug dealing and the state needed to find evidence of, the, of that communication between her that and... That is correct. That's, so that's the leading case on that. Now, what is cybercrime? Well, cybercrime is nothing else but crime. Right. <laughs> I always get the, the question, uh, then why do we call it cybercrime? Well, the yeah. reason why we call it cybercrime is because these are criminal offences that are either being committed using a computer right. or associated to a computer or related to a computer, or the contents of the data, in other words, in the case of child pornography, is illegal. And it is there where the criminality comes, and that is where we then say cybercrime. Right. Now, in respect of distinction between crime, so you get white-collar crime, blue-collar crime, and now cybercrime. Mm. But essentially what you're saying, there has to be a computer involved. There has to be some hardware and software involved. You see, that's the nice thing. Our, our definition now of, yes. of computer, right. I think, has, has reached the stage or evolved yes. where your handhelds, your laptops, your cell phones, they, they all now have computing power. Right. You know, they've got processors. Anything that uses a, a, a computing processor and, and, and communicates can be deemed as a, a, a computer for the purposes of cyber criminal sanction. Now, 
Which law specifically, I think you touched on it briefly, which law specifically deals with cyber law? Is, is there a set of legislation? Well, cyber law is a hybrid law. Right. And, and being a hybrid law means that it is not one of your traditional sources of law. Mm -hmm. It sources from various uh, parts of legislation. I just mentioned to you now the Interception and Monitoring Act. Right. There is obviously the e Electronic Communications and Transactions Act, right. the ECT, Act 2000, um, uh, 2002 Act. And that specific act is the one that basically deals with all your electronic communications. Um, your writing and signature requirements. And then from section 86 right up to section 89, mm -hmm. it deals now with cyber criminal um, actions. Okay. Now, we, it's time for a short break. And when we come back, we're going to deal specifically with section 86 onwards. Awesome. Please stay Let's tuned and join us after the short break. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back to Legal Ease. As mentioned in the previous section, my very special guest tonight is Cesare Snail of Cesare Snail Attorneys and he's an expert in the field of cyber law. And you're welcome to call in and try and engage with him if you have any questions regarding hacking, cracking, or if you're a victim of a cyber crime. Uh, as usual, the number is 011-086-77-001203 and the number appears on your screen. So, we were talking about section 86, okay? The section 86 is where you find the law that says what you can and what you can't do and what is illegal and what is, what is legal. So, help us understand that. Yeah, section 86.1 is basically your anti-hacking Right. Uh, law. Now, what is hacking? Let's just deal with what is hacking. Well, hacking is anyone who, without your permission, enters your information system, either by circumventing uh, the information system using software or, or password crackers or things like that. Now, one hears of cookies, you know, whenever you get onto a site and it says, this site uses cookies. Right. Now, w w what, what's cookies? Well, cookies is information that the website collects right. uh, pertaining to the people who access the website. Okay. It may be your IP address, it may be geographical location. Uh, this is all the information that, that is sent from one computer to another. Right. And they use that for various types of sampling and of analyzing uh, the type of people who are accessing the website. Unfortunately, your privacy may be affected and, and some of your private information may get into the wrong hands. Well, look, let's say you're doing internet banking and uh, you, you, you enter your password and you know all your secret codes and you're doing fund transfers. Right. And somebody plants a cookie. Your, your information is now out there. It's exposed. What happens if you're a victim of, of cybercrime? Well, in most cases, the people who are victims of cybercrime don't even know that they're victims right. of cybercrime. Uh, usually, they use things like password sniffers, mm -hmm. keystroke analyzers. In other words, you will get someone who is actively sitting somewhere on the other side of the world, right. watching you with your web camera and controlling your web camera and watching your keystrokes. So. Uh, one of the things that I always tell people is that if you're online and you're using a webcam and you're not specifically using it at that time, it's just to close it. Because anyone can access any of the, the gadgets that are attached to your computer with the right knowledge. So what you're really saying is there's no secrets. I mean, everything is out there. It's all open. But what if I'm a victim of, of, of cybercrime? Let's say somebody borrows my passwords, uh, passes money, especially where you have credit card transactions. Mm. You're buying from Amazon or you're buying from a, another a dealer or a supplier. Now you're obliged to put in your credit card, your secret PIN number, and then suddenly somebody else is using this card to make purchases. 
How do you protect yourself from that? Well, the way of going about it is, is first of all, contact your service provider, your financial institution, advise them that your, your passwords have been compromised or that your credit card details have been compromised so that they deactivate that. And, and also to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future, go to the SAPS, report these matters. I always get to hear that, yes, but, but people are not equipped, people don't know about this, and, and if you do report it, people don't want to open a case. The mm. more cases we open and the more awareness there is about this, right. the more educated even the police and the prosecutorial authorities will be, and we will finally be able to deal with cyber criminality. Now, often we hear of worms and uh, uh, attacks coming on, and then they say, uh, you, you know, your software, your firewalls your, uh, might not be adequate to protect your, your computer against an attack. Right. I think there were some very, very serious attacks a few years ago. And on a political level, you often read in the newspapers of governments hacking each other's systems in order to maybe get into a nuclear site, which is yes. quite worrying. Cyber warfare, yes. which is a, a creature on its own, is, is the new type of warfare that we're entering into these days. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is now where you are sitting here in South Africa and you are investigating what is happening in China. Right. In fact, the Chinese government actually has a whole building, an unmarked building in China, and that's what they do. They do counterintelligence using the internet. So it's this, this modern day espionage now also uses electronic devices and it's, it's all colluded now. You know, it's, a, it's very cloudy. Okay. We, we don't know what is permissible and what is not permissible anymore. We spoke and touched very briefly on hacking and cracking. Is there, and circumvention. Now, is there a difference between what I'm in, in each of these words? I mean, for the layman, hacking was always something you had to do with the chopper, you know, you, you hacked at something. But with, with the advent of, of, of cyber, as we know it, hacking has taken on a whole new meaning. Well, hacking is, is accessing someone's information system without having permission to do so. Okay. Is that a crime? Of course. As oh. I said, Section 86.1 specifically deals with that. Right. And then cracking pertains more to circumventing passwords. Okay. In other words, where you now have a, a software or a hardware that uses algorithms to figure out passwords. Okay. And, and circumventing that, I think, speaks for itself. This is now where you use software or hardware to circumvent a protection measure that mm -hmm. has been put in place, for instance, to stop you from copying a movie or to stop you from giving access to someone else. Mm -hmm. Again, how does one prevent this kind of thing happening? I mean, are there measures that one can take? There's always measures that one can take. And, and the old saying, prevention is better than cure, right. is, is definitely key. Um, one needs to be informed about the dangers of going online, mm -hmm. the dangers of using your handset, the dangers of, of uh, leaving your laptop open at the workplace whilst you go out and maybe have your lunch break. Mm. You know? Those are the small things that people forget. And that is where usually the data becomes compromised, and that is where then cyber criminals get away. So I think awareness and education as to how to use devices in a safe manner mm -hmm. is, is the first step to avoid being a victim of cyber criminality. So just give us a couple of practical examples. Well, you already said don't leave your laptop open when you're going out of the office. Um, right. Most of your handsets are password protected. But... You, you know, you, you, could, you, you could be a victim of it at any stage. I understand that uh, if you're using your laptop in an in a, in a internet cafe, the person on the next table could steal your information as, you, as you're sitting there. The, the same rules as when you go to the ATM basically apply. Right. You need to look left, you need to look right. Right. You need to check who's checking you. <laughs> okay. If, if you're in a public place, if you're using a public internet cafe, avoid using that because maybe some of the cyber criminals install malware, uh, which then they can go later on and, and track down some of the information that went through that specific computer. Mm. So I think vigilance is of key. Um, most of your mobile devices use Android. Yes. And Android being an open platform yeah. means that it is really open. <laughs> right. So a, a, a lot of people are unaware of the dangers 
of using your banking apps and, and so forth. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use them, but if you are using them, you should use them in a limited way, in such a way that you, you don't compromise your, your passwords, you don't leave autofill on, mm -hmm. for instance. You know that function where you automatically fill in the passwords? Right, right. Those are things that one should rather not do. You know, yes, you have the convenience of simply logging on and, right. and using it, but what is if you lose the device? Right. It means then that the next person will also just simply log on and, and then do transactions. So it's, like I said, it's, a, it's an education thing. And I think it starts, it starts at primary level, even your school kids. You know, you see all these school kids carrying around handheld devices, tablets, and so forth. Yes. It, is, it starts there. And a reminder to our viewers, our lines are open, and you are welcome to call in. The number is 11 or 3. And please take advantage of calling our expert and finding out about cyber law. Are you a victim of uh, hacking? What can you do to prevent it? Uh, where do you turn? Where, 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 let's say I'm a victim of, of hacking. Where do I go? Where, what, who do I charge? What, what do I do? Where do I complain? Well, usually cyber crime is a faceless crime, unfortunately. Right. In most cases, you won't know who the actual perpetrator is. The right. perpetrator could be sitting in Kazakhstan and, and he could be accessing information from here. So the rules are, are, are relatively straightforward. You go to the police and you report the matter mm -hmm. and, and you let the law take its course. It's but, but in this case, it's the perpetrator unknown. Will the police still investigate it? Yes. The, the, the police, for instance, have a cybercrime lab here in South Africa. Right. They do have the relevant tools and the relevant technology to follow IP addresses, to find out where a particular person was accessing your information system from, right. the area. They can even um, locate it up to about 100 and 300 meters to, okay. to actually see where this particular perpetrator is. So there are ways of, of following them, but obviously this is now subject to your privacy laws again. Yes. So yes, it, yes. it is mostly the, the, the law enforcement agencies that have those capabilities to do that. Okay. Um, recently, uh, just to come back on the topic of hacking, it was quite worrying to read that a passenger was able to take over the controls of a passenger airline. I mean, just from his seat. Uh, yeah, you see, the thing is we, we use Bluetooth, we use Wi-Fi, we use all these open platforms. You know, every time when we uh, use technology to, to give us convenience, yes, yes. we should know that we are also making it convenient for the cyber criminals to attack. Right. So sometimes we need just to take a seat back and, and, and stop the convenience and do things the old-fashioned way. But what, what my point is, it's quite worrying to know that you are able to control an airliner. I mean, I mean you could do anything with that, with that, with that airliner. You could... Uh, you know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the, the airlines do have their own cybersecurity protocols that they go through. Uh, hence, when you are on a plane, they tell you to switch off your handheld, yes. they tell you to switch off your Wi-Fi. It is for those reasons. Yes. Because obviously the plane is communicating with the outside world. It is being tracked by satellites and all of that. So it is those information channels that, that become the, the entry points mm -hmm. for, 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 for such unlawful actions, such as such a person who's controlling a plane whilst being on a plane. All right. That might be a convenient place to pause. Uh, we're going for a short break. Please stay tuned and join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to the second half of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Now, tonight, helping us to understand hacking and cyber law, we are joined by Cesar Snail of Cesar Snail Attorneys in Pretoria, a person who is ex extremely well qualified in the field of cyber law. Um, Cesar, we were talking about uh, uh, cyber crime itself and, and what measures, you know, if you're a victim. Now, with regard to uh, preserving, opt 
I think we have a caller. Please, uh, uh, caller, please go ahead. Caller, can you hear us? I will come back to the caller. Okay. Now, with regard to uh, obtaining, preserving uh, evidence in, 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 in a situation where there's cybercrime, mm -hmm. what processes are, are involved there? Or, or how does one go about it? Well, you know, you, you've got your real-time evidence, right. which is the evidence that, that is taken online. In yes. other words, whilst the crime is, is being committed, yeah. you know, you have that real-time evidence, and then you also have your evidence that you can get from a computer that has just been stored there. Right. In most cases, um, the investigating authorities will use a search and seizure warrant right. to seize the computer items. Yes. They will then be kept in a place of storage, either by the registrar of the court or the sheriff of the court. And then on that particular day um, of the trial, that information will then be brought to court and that way, the, the chain of custody mm. of the evidence is, is restored. And, and, well, not even restored, maintained, actually. Yeah. Uh, because in most cases, uh, the chain of custody is the one that is attacked. Right. Where they say, but how do I know that that is my computer? And how do I know that you didn't put any um, evidence on there? Right. So it, it's, it's very, very tricky. So when, when, when dealing with cyber uh, crime, one really needs to try and get your evidence from early stages, yes, because the the old methods of detective investigating months later, usually the evidence will be gone. Right. So one really needs to try and 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 catch the perpetrator whilst he's busy doing it. But ISPs as well are, are assisting ISPs being uh, internet service providers. Right. They do keep logs. Yes. They do keep data trails. Yes. And um, they are also then now subpoenaed by the courts to provide, for instance, like I said, IP addresses, that's the, your internet protocol. Each and every computer, each and every handheld device has a unique number mm -hmm. called this IP address. Right. And it is with that IP address that they then can track you down and, and, and locate you specifically. So there are ways of, of getting the evidence, preserving it, and, and producing it properly in court. But I mean, I think what you're saying is there's a very specific mechanism or methodology in that. And if there's a breach of those things, then it could lead to the result that, that the evidence is not accepted because there was a breach in, in how it was that is taken correct. and preserved and ultimately produced. Um, a lot of people don't understand that actually electronic evidence is admissible. Right. Section 15 of the ECT is very clear. It says that evidence that is in electronic form should not necessarily be disregarded because it is in electronic form. It is, however, the evidential weight right. that then becomes an issue. Okay. How the evidence was stored, how reliable the device is that where you've stored the information. During the copying process, have you copied everything right. bit for bit? Or has, has there been uh, contamination taken place? Mm -hmm. So it is the, the um, admissibility is not usually the issue. It's the evidential weight right. which is the issue. Now... Let's just touch briefly on cyberbullying and intimidation. Uh, if you're a victim of cyberbullying, intimidation, mm -hmm. just just help us understand what what does that really amount to? Is that is that hate speech on social media network? I, mean, I know recently there have been a number of convictions. I think there were some students mm -hmm. that made uh, certain false allegations against a principal on social media, and they were held to be liable for defamation. Yes, so what, what, what you do in the, in the real world, mm -hmm. there is a functional equivalent of that on the internet. Right. In other words, if you are going to go and defame people on the internet, there was that recent case here in Johannesburg of, of, of a lady who was making comments about her ex-husband right. and the fact that he, he sees young children and that he's taking drugs. And she posted this on Facebook. Right. And the court actually ordered her to remove those postings and that she must pay. Mm -hmm. um, similarly to, to cyberbullying and, and harassment, we do now have the Harassment Act, okay. um, which allows you to approach a court of law, not necessarily a high court. You can go mm. to, to a normal magistrate's court now 
if you are the victim of, of a stalker, of, of a harasser, you can actually go there and, and get an interdict similar to those interdicts that they have for family domestic violence. That's very, very interesting. So if somebody's posting um, stories or uh, tracking you and bombarding you with SMSs or, or social media, uh, whatever, WhatsApp messages, and you feel uncomfortable. You feel harassed. Harassed, eh? <laughs> So you can ask uh, for protection. Yes, you can go to court. You can say that there is a number, a particular number. And if you know the individual, you can say there's a particular individual with a particular number who's constantly calling me at night, who's constantly SMSing me. And then if, if we can identify that person, we can then serve the order on them, prohibiting them from doing that. But... Typically, if you are receiving uh, anonymous phone calls, you, that number is, is held, it's a private number, what would you do in that case? How would you go about finding out who this person is so that you could get relief? Well, there's, there's a, a couple of uh, computer forensic firms in South Africa that, that have got very smart toys, as mm -hmm. we call them, and, and they can usually get to what we cannot see. In other words, when it says withheld on your phone, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is withheld. It just means that somewhere, somehow, it is being blocked by a software. But the same way that the software is blocking that information, mm. another software can reveal that information. But that's totally legal, am I right? I mean, you, you're now going to seek help from another person who will probably monitor your phone. So that's legal. It's not illegal. He's monitoring your calls. Well, in terms of Rika, if, if you have consented to monitoring, yes. then obviously, yes, then, then such monitoring is legal. Right. So there you don't have much of an issue. The issue usually comes in where you don't have the consent. Right. That is now where you would have to go see a magistrate or a judge, or go an affidavit and explain to the court as to why the court should authorize this invasion of privacy. Mm. I mean, you must remember your right to privacy is not absolute. Right. Under certain circumstances, the state can invade your privacy. Right. State security, in the case of criminal investigations. Yes. And it, it, it applies horizontally and vertically. In other words, it is the state and also between private individuals where this right to privacy can be flexible. So right. under certain instances, a court will step in and will limit your right to privacy. Okay, um, but just to come back to that point, let's say I'm receiving telephone calls and they are threatening of an, and of a harassing nature. Where do I go? Who, who do I see and say, look, I have a complaint. I don't know who's calling me. Uh, please assist me. Will the police be able to, to trace uh, the, the caller? Well, maybe not the police officer taking your case. Yes. But as I said, the, the South African police do have a cybercrime unit. Right. And this specific unit do have the technology and people who are specifically trained who do have the know-how how to get to this information. In the instance where maybe it is difficult to get to the information or someone is, is, is crying privacy, then even that specific unit of the court can use the Criminal Procedure Act. Okay. Um, there's a specific section there that says that you must deliver up a document, for instance, right. or information then that section can be used to force whoever has got that information to bring that information to court so that the prosecution can be successful. I mean, would that include your service provider? Um, Definitely. In other words, this is now where the service provider is, a, is told to deliver up information regarding its client. Right. I mean, a service provider, by law, is a conduit. In other words, they are merely a middleman. Right. They're merely providing a service. Right. So as much as they're providing a service, they also have a duty to protect your privacy. Right. But as I said, under certain circumstances or under certain justified reasons, right. a court or an investigative authority may approach an ISP mm -hmm. and then request these logs of this information or the, the trail of a specific cyber criminal and, and, and how he has been doing these things online. Okay, well, time for another short break. Please stay tuned and join us after this break. Spam and jurisdiction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to the last segment of Legal Ease. 
We are reminded that our lines are open and you're welcome to call in on 011-086-770-123. And tonight, you can call in and ask anything you'd like to know about cybercrime, hacking, circumventing, cracking, anything to do with your cell phones. Now, just before the break, we were talking uh, to our very special guest, uh, Caesar Snail of Caesar Snail Attorneys in Pretoria. Um, with regard to uh, cybercrime itself, what, what you know, what jurisdictions do our courts enjoy um, to to let's say try a international case? Is is a jurisdiction? Well, currently, Section ninety of the ECT right uh, gives our court a, a very wide jurisdiction. Due to the, the borderless nature of the internet, mm -hmm. um, the, the ECT accepts that certain crimes may be started in another country, yeah. may have an effect here, or they may be started here and have an effect in another country. So uh, our courts generally have a very wide jurisdiction also to try uh, offenders who, who may have hacked from a foreign country. The moment that they enter the republic, we can then nab them and we can then try them. But entering is now physical entering into into the country. But obviously, you you know on the on the other hand, there's all this uh, stuff that's going on in cyberspace. Uh, the world is a village. You don't have to physically come. I mean, yes, but but the 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 act also goes further. It also talks about uh, having a presence there. In other words, if you have a company in right. South Africa mm. and and you are running illegal activities from another country right um, that on itself can found jurisdiction to a South African court as well spam you know you often get 419 what we what what is known as the 419 scheme now this is based on the Nigerian penal code section 419 which is basically fraud that's right what happens is you open your even your Skype and suddenly somebody is saying, I got money for you in a bank. They're spamming you. Right. Then there's phishing. But let's, let's just talk about spamming. What is spam? Well, spam is, is also called unsolicited mail or unsolicited communication. Um, these are communications that you haven't asked for. Right. This is where people are sending you marketing material, either on your phone or on your emails. For instance, here in South Africa, we, we have an organization called WASPA, mm -hmm. the Wireless Application Service Providers Association. Right. And in terms of that, uh, there are certain practices such as spamming, um, marketing uh, during certain prohibited hours, mm -hmm. um, not having opt-out provisions. Okay. So there, there are mechanisms, even in the Consumer Protection Act now, right. that uh, are against spamming or unsolicited mail, as we call it. Yeah, so more specifically in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, you can go on, register your cell phone number and your name and your email address and make it very clear that you do not want to be receiving telephone calls by anyone selling you some or other holiday package. That's correct. Or something that you, you never you, asked you for. You even have the right to ask that person when he contacts you mm. where he got your information from. And if he or she refused to do that, in terms yeah. of Section 45, yeah. you may actually be criminally sanctionable. Now, often they put down the phone on you. Now, how do you go about <laughs> reporting them? Because you don't know where this person called. Unless you get into a conversation, you get the name, you get the name of the company. And you say, okay. As I said, with, with cell phones, we do now have this, this WASPA. Right. In terms of which all the, the major cell phone uh, telecommunications companies are members of that. Okay. And by merely identifying that SMS, uh, each and every one of those uh, companies that send you bulk email right. will usually have a unique number. Okay. And it is through that unique number that we can then identify the, the perpetrating company or the spamming company, as right. we would say. And it's, it's based on that, then you can take the matter further. Now, I've come across a uh, message that I've received and it says, uh, SMS back, stop to opt out. Now, why should I be SMSing them when I never requested that information to be sent to me in the first place? Well, there's, there's a very interesting conflict in the law right now. Right. Your Electronic Communications Transactions Act says you should opt out. Okay. But the Consumer Protection Act now says you should opt in. Mm. So what is opting in and what is opting out? 
Well, opting in is where you physically give your consent. Right. Or where you tick on a box. Yes. You know those forms in the bank where they ask you, may we SMS yes, you, may yes. we? And you simply tick them because you're irritated. Yeah. You're actually giving your consent for them. You are opting in. In, right. And then the opting out is, is, is a requirement. Well, it was a requirement by law to say that where you are be the recipient of uh, unsolicited mail, you should at mm -hmm. least be able to stop that person from sending you further mail. Right. And that is then the opting out provision. Mm. So basically, I think what you said earlier on, you know, one has to be vigilant and careful. Now often, and we, we do it quite innocently, we get onto a site and you give your information, your date of birth, your age, etc., etc. And there at the bottom they say uh, terms and conditions and you say, tick, I accept it. Strangely enough, our, our law now recognizes what we call incorporation by reference. Okay. Now, incorporation by reference basically means that where you say, click on I agree to the terms and conditions, and there is a link to those terms and conditions, right. you are actually saying that you actually clicked on that click link and you accessed the terms and conditions yes, yes. and you read them. Yes. So it's that old story of volenti non fit in Nuria. Yeah. You know, you well, just, you, just you agree to that. Yes. You know, you, you you cannot claim now that you, you you did not know about a particular term and condition because you you agree to it. Yeah. So just be careful the next time you tick off uh, a a site and it says uh, I've read the terms and conditions and if you haven't read those terms and conditions it's advisable not to tick it. That's but often correct. you can't you can't you can't access that site without ticking off. I mean, uh, where it says T's and C's, yes. T's and C's actually means terms and conditions. conditions. And it, but in terms of the the Consumer Protection Act, even those terms and conditions need to be clear. Right. I'm not too sure whether T's and C's um, would would surpass that. Yes. I've always asked myself. What is T and what is a C, you mm -hmm. know? Because in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, you need to be very clear right. that these are the terms and conditions that you are agreeing to in the specific transactions. All right. Now, with regard to um, your, your, daily, your daily protection of, uh, let's say, your children, um, you know, they, almost everybody is is uh, equipped with a, a cell phone of some kind. What advice would you give our viewers to protect the use of those devices by children? Well, I, I strictly believe that um, these electronic devices can be very useful. Yes. Some of them can even be used as mobile trackers. You can, right. you can track where your child is, what they're doing. And yes. However, on the education side, maybe one should train your kids that mm. don't go telling everyone on Facebook that I am not at home now. Yes, yes. Now you're telling the whole world that you're not at home. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, you know, who knows um, where you are at that particular time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and don't just give out all your private details, right. your phone number, yes. your address, uh, and so forth. Your pictures. I mean, your pictures. In fact, in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, even it may even be illegal to take pictures of your children and to simply post them there, you know, because your children haven't uh, agreed to this. Yes, you know, yes. so and it's a, minors. it's a, it's an infringement of their mm. bodily integrity. Mm. Mm. Uh, it appears that we've run out of time, unfortunately. Uh, it just leaves me time to thank you, the viewers, for having joined us tonight, and my very special guest, Cesar Snail. Thank you very much for taking the time and trouble to be with us here tonight educating us and explaining to our viewers a very important topic of cyber law, hacking, and what one can do to protect oneself. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, if the viewers want any further information, they're more than welcome to access snailattorneys.com or lex-informatica.org where they can find more useful uh, articles right. um, and further legal assistance if they have anything that they're in trouble with. Thank you very much. On that excellent note, it's time to say goodbye. Adios. <laughs>